This is a story that a user on Reddit posted, and I had the conversation with this person through Reddit chat. I asked them if they could provide me with any more information, such as pictures or anything like that, but apparently they don't have any more knowledge than what they've posted here. I don't know. I couldn't find this woman anywhere listed on any missing person sites. So I'm just going to read this, what this person has posted, and hopefully if, if uh, anyone else out there knows anything about this story, they can direct me to the right links. This is from uh, co um, Code Cases on Reddit. My great aunt Barbara Hansen has been missing since the 70s. She may have been a victim of Ted Bundy. Is there anything I can do? So the story goes, my grandma was reading the newspaper and we were eating breakfast. She read an article in the paper about a woman who, who had Alzheimer's who turned out to be a missing person. We discussed this case and she asked me if I knew that we had a missing person in our family. It was a bombshell to me. My great-aunt, Barbara Hansen, who was called Barbie, was born in the 1950s. They said that she was a free spirit and basically just went and did anything she wanted to do. When some of the family moved to Florida in the 1970s, she came home one night, dropped off a boombox, said she had a date, and left. That was the last time anyone saw her. One of my grandma's sisters said she had been talking to someone from a biker gang and they thought that maybe she had gone off with them. They filed a missing person report, which I could not find anything, and unless I'm using the wrong name, I couldn't find any missing person report. I will continue to look, but if anyone else out there can find that, please direct me to it. They filed a missing person report, and they searched for a long time. I will say this, it could be possible that they filed a missing person report with the local police, and that's as far as it went. Uh, in the 1970s, there weren't as many, you know, outlets out there. There was no such thing as the Internet, and this may not have been picked up as a big story to run on the news, and it may not have gone any farther than the local police department. Um, my grandma and her siblings still look through the papers for obituaries or missing persons, hoping they may find her. The reason she believes Ted Bundy may have been involved is because around the time he was active, it was around the same time that he was active. She had a dream about her sister being at a bar with a man who she later realized looked like Ted Bundy. Um, I think this was just fear on the grandmother's part that it was in her mind that he, he may have been in that area around the time that she went missing. I have been looking for anything that I could find on this family member, which I only just learned about. My grandmother typed out what she knows, and this is all that we have on the situation. Her full name was Barbara Mildred Hansen. She was a white female. She was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 1952. My grandma has done DNA with Ancestry around 2019, but nothing has shown up. Taking a break for right now while we wait to hear back from family. I'll keep updating when I have any more information. She lived in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and she disappeared in a small town near Destin in the late summer of 1978. She was last known to be wearing blue jeans, a red halter top, and moccasin shoes. She had a large gold and jade ring on her first finger that was too big for her, but she never took it off. She was thin, around 115 to 120 pounds, around 5 foot 5 inches tall, with green eyes and dark brown hair. 
It was believed that she was on heroin or cocaine at the time that she disappeared. The last possible confirmed sighting of her was in October of 1978 at Frank's Bar in Wisconsin with this biker gang. The possible sighting was made by one of her sister's friends. Um, and that was really all I could find on this. I we even went through all of the comments to see if anybody maybe, you know, found a link to her. Um, I couldn't find her on Name Us or any of those. And so I just, I did want to share that. Um, it says here, Bun Bundy only operated in Florida for a very short time. He escaped on New Year's Eve 1978 and was apparently apprehended in Florida in February of 1978. Um, she was thought to have gone missing in 1978, I think the article said October. So Bundy may have already have been in custody at that point. That was really all I had on this woman's case, and I'm just going to move on to another one here. I found this one on Unsolved Appalachia. Francis D. Crownover. On November the 26th, 1987, 34-year-old Francis Sandy Crownover and her friend Joseph Dunaw went to bed at around 11 p.m. Francis was staying with Joseph. Joseph at his residence in Harrison, Tennessee. Joseph says when he awoke the next morning, Sandy was gone. She left a note telling him she would call him later, but she never did call. November the 28th, 1987, this would have been two days later, Sandy called a friend from a convenience store. I couldn't find any information regarding who this friend was or the time frame. However, this was the last time anyone claimed to have talked to her. She left behind all of her belongings and her clothing, including her vehicle, was, which was parked at Joseph's house. Joseph claims that she had around $200 that she took with her. Joseph reported her missing on December the 4th, 1987 to the Hamilton County Police Department. They responded to the call. They arrived at his residence where he told him that Francis had some mental problems. He also advised that he had already spoken to many of her friends and none of them had heard from her. As far as I know, there have been no sightings of Sandy since November of 1987 and no leads. I couldn't locate any records to indicate Joseph had any kind of criminal or violent background. There is little information to work with on this disappearance. Where was the location of the store that she made the call from? She took cash with her but no belongings. That doesn't seem like a very productive way to run away and start over. Why would she not have taken her car? Endless theories and no answers. If you have any information on the disappearance of Francis Crownover, you can contact the Hamilton County, Tennessee Sheriff's Office at 423-622-0022. And there are no updates available on this story. I think there was another story about her on the Charlie Project. Missing since November the 26th, 1987. She is an endangered female. She's a white female born in 1953. 5 foot 2 and 105 pounds. She was last thought to be wearing light blue pants and a long sleeve sweater. She may have suffered from some mental disabilities or mental illness. She had blonde hair and hazel eyes and went by the nickname Sandy. Um, that's really all there was on her story. These were just a couple that I couldn't find a whole lot of information on. This next one does have a little bit more detail. This is on Unsolved Appalachia. Aura Lawrence Barrick. Aura Eileen Lawrence Barrick. 
We just want to give our mother a proper burial, and we really know that she's at peace. That's what has bothered me through all these years, thinking about how she died and wondering if she was at peace. Aura Eileen Barrick was born January the 16th, 1935. She went missing April the 12th, 1996 from Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. She was 5 foot 5 and 120 pounds. She had gray hair and green eyes. She had surgical scars on her back. She wires dentures and she was a smoker. Aura Eileen Lawrence Barrick was a widow who resided by herself in a small cabin off of an isolated road near Mammoth Cave, Kentucky for 15 years. Eileen, as she was known, was last seen walking her dog on Laurel Ridge Road on April the 12th, 1996. She spoke to a neighbor's son who was staying at his parents' cabin at around 2 p.m. that day. She was never seen or heard from again. Rural area is kind of an understatement. It's all just hills and hollers and old homes with wells and sinkholes. One of her neighbors reported her missing three days later. She only had two neighbors. Law enforcement went to her residence and discovered, and discovered all the lights were off and the doors were locked. There was no sign of a forced entry. Law enforcement went inside and discovered blood on the floor and, and sofa, and the sofa was pushed out of place. In the bedroom, the bed sheet and the fitted sheet were there, Blood-stained clothes lay on top of her bed. A glass that normally sat beside her bed on a nightstand was laying on the floor. Her purse, along with her bed sheet, were missing. Her dentures were soaking in their container inside the bathroom, along with a burned-out cigarette bud. A new plastic trash bag was placed over her trash can before whatever happened had occurred. It would appear as though her nightly routine was interrupted. A bag of trash sat atop the kitchen counter ready to be taken out the next morning. Her house keys and her truck keys were located. Her house keys were located inside of her truck and her truck keys were still inside the house. She kept $400 cash inside her freezer and it was there when the house was searched. A fake rock that she normally kept an extra house key set outside her house was missing. It's uncertain if she always kept it there. Her Pomeranian dog, Fifi, was locked inside of its crate. She had reportedly been dating a younger man at the time, but none of her family knew him. Authorities believe that her body may have been wrapped in the missing bed sheet and buried in a shallow grave close to her home. Cadaver dogs were used in the beginning and the investigation without any success. Barrack had employed a handyman at the time that she disappeared. Little is known about him. Law enforcement did interview a man who was guilty of attacking an older woman in another state, but he wasn't charged. Foul play is suspected in the case and is being treated as a homicide. I suspect someone in the, now this is from her family member, I suspect it was someone in the immediate vicinity who walked over to her house that night, interrupted her routine, or someone she knew intimately that was there inside her home that night. I leaned toward a neighbor who knew her well enough to walk over to her door that she would have opened the door for or they got this key, they knew about the key, and they came inside the house and took her by surprise. Either they came through an unlocked door or the key that she kept outside. I'd like to know the name of the boy that was staying at his parents' cabin that she said that said he spoke to her earlier that day, as well as the handyman. Now, there is a story about the handyman on another page, and I will read about him. Missing since April the 12th, 1996, from Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. 
She's a white female. She was born in 1935. She was 61 years old at the time of her disappearance. Five foot five and 120 pounds. No one is sure of what clothing she was wearing, but she was known to wear denim shorts, and they believe that she may have been wearing a pair of denim shorts. She had gray hair and green eyes. Um, she goes by her middle name, Aline, A-L-Y-N-E. -E. She only had two permanent neighbors, and most of the other homes in the area were vacation homes, and no one was staying there. When one of her neighbors realized they had not seen her out walking her dog in three days, they contacted the police. The police went to her home, and it just goes on to give the same details. According to her family, the fact that she had taken her dentures out prior to her disappearance indicates she wasn't, suspect, she wasn't expecting anyone. They say that she was never seen without her dentures and only took them out before she went to bed at night. The widow, since 1982, and she lived in a cabin near Nolan River, Kentucky. Um, that morning she had gone to a chiropractic doctor's appointment, and after her appointment she went to a tanning salon and then stopped by the house of the handyman she had hired. According to her daughter Kay, Eileen then went home. She was supposed to spend the weekend with her brother, Pete Jackson, in Frankfort, Kentucky. But she called her sister-in-law to tell her she wasn't coming, and she did not give a reason why. Police told Dateline that during her walk, she ran into some teenagers. Now, see, in the other story, it was just one young man, but it says she ran into some teenagers who were staying at a nearby cabin, and she stopped and had a casual conversation with them. Police say that when she returned home, she began her bedtime routine. She had closed her blinds, lit a cigarette, took her dentures out, and was probably getting ready to settle in for the night. It seems that her routine was interrupted abruptly. Her cigarette would be found burned down on the bathroom counter. Is it possible that they thought that if they left the cigarette there burning, it would catch fire, burn the cabin down, and do away with the evidence, blood? And Did they test this blood for any kind of DNA that was other than her own? Her family says if she had already taken her teeth out, she would have cleaned them and put them back in because she would never let anyone see her without her teeth. So if someone was there she would have put her teeth back in, and if she was by herself, she would have taken them out before she got into bed. Kentucky State Police Detective Jason Lanham, previously a lead detective on the case, said the police who responded to the call said there was no sign of forced entry into the home, and they, along with her family, believed that whoever came to her door that night either knocked and she knew them and let them in, or they used the outdoor key and let themselves in. It would have had to have been someone who knew about that key. Detective Lanham found Eileen's car at her home and her keys were inside her house. Her dog was locked inside of its crate. There were signs of a struggle inside the home and there was blood. Police believe that Eileen may have been trying to reach her gun that she kept at her bedside table. There were small amounts of blood in the bedroom and blood in the living room. The only item that seemed to be missing was her purse and the top bed sheet. Police have conducted group searches in the area and have drained lakes and had scuba divers come in to search. They also used cadaver dogs as late as the winter of 2016. The investigation is ongoing, and they have had some persons of interest, but there have been no substantial leads. We haven't had enough evidence or leads to make a true suspect or get enough information to charge anybody.
Kay said she and the family suspect Aline's handyman, whose house she stopped by that day. This is probably the reason why she decided not to go visit her brother. She may have talked to this man and set up a date, and he may have been at her home that night when this took place. He may have been, you know, that may have been his intention, was to rob her. Or maybe she was in the bathroom doing her night routine and came in to find him attempting to rob her. And an argument broke out, and this is what happened. Detective Lanham confirmed to Dateline that police did interview the man and that he had served time in Illinois for crimes unrelated to Aileen's disappearance. He did not know if he was in jail at this time and could not confirm any information or release his name. On the 22nd anniversary of their mother's disappearance, Kay and the rest of the family are continuing to search for her, for Eileen. It's like having a nightmare that you can never wake up from, she told Dateline. She still hopes to put her mother to rest. She deserves to be buried and not just thrown away. She would now be the grandmother of seven grandkids, four girls and three boys. She would now be 84 years old. And if you have any information, you can contact the Kentucky State Police at 270-782-2010. So I did find the story that I wanted to share on this person of interest. Now I'm sharing this from a website called Crime Blogger 1983 Blogspot. And I'm going to just read this. Um, this is from this person who, who runs this page, Crime Blogger. I have made some progress on the case of Aline Barrick. I was provided some information from another blogger of which I have followed up from on several channels, and it paid off. I have the name of the person of interest that police questioned regarding her disappearance. He was the so-called handyman and likely was also the younger boyfriend or the younger man that apparently Elaine had been talking to. Apparently he lived along Laurel Ridge Road as well. He had a wife and family living with him. Now, I'm reading this from this website. This is the person that the police did interview and this is just some stuff about his background. This is public record. Now, this is unrelated to Aileen's disappearance. This is just his background. Okay, so here are some facts about him. He was ruled as sexually violent. He has a long history of violence against women. In 1987, he was convicted in Quebec, Canada of rape. He raped a woman that he met in, the bar, in a bar, and he was serving in the Navy at the time. He received a bad... Dis uh, bad conduct discharge from the Navy and with three within three months of this attack he attacked another woman in Kentucky when that within hours of that attack he within hours of that attack he coerced his way into another woman's home and assaulted her as a result of both of these assaults he was convicted of rape burglary, and unlawful imprisonment. He was sentenced to 10 years in the Kentucky Department of Corrections. Apparently, he was released in 1994. Less than two years after his release, he was convicted of assaulting a woman in Chicago. And um, he was sentenced to 29 years as a result of that attack. His M.O. is that he would go in and attack these women, but I don't see anything saying that he was charged with any type of attempted murder or anything. Could it be that Aileen, I don't know, they said that she had a gun that she kept in her bedside table. Did the police check to see if that gun was there and if it had been fired? Was it possible that she made her way to that table and got the gun and that he got the gun away from her and used it to kill her. 
it just says I will continue to keep everyone posted and I will continue to follow up on this case. That was really all I could find on him. He was a suspect. The police did talk to him. And I guess they just didn't have enough evidence. But like I said, did they take blood samples from the blood that was found on her clothing, on the bed, the blood in the living room, the blood in the floor? Did they do fingerprints? I mean, if he claimed that the two of them were dating or talking or seeing each other or whatever, it might account for his fingerprints being in her home. I can find more on this, and thanks for watching.